Um, and now to introduce this evening's speaker, uh, Kevin Murphy, who many of you will know, whose current job is he's the director of the, the study abroad program for the University of New Haven out at Prato. If you don't know Prato, it's well worth a, a day trip. It's very close and it's a beautiful city and it's not so many tourists, so that's kind of good. Um, uh, and before that, it, he, he did most of his studies in London at the Courtauld, Courtauld Institute up to the level of PhD and then moved to Florence some 30 years ago. And he tells me that his very first ever uh, lecture as an art historian was here, here at the British Institute of Florence, doing a Wednesday lecture. So it's kind of full circle for Kevin. And then he went on to become the head of the art history program here in, at the Institute for a number of years before moving to his current role over at Prato. So Kevin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope my microphone is on. Yeah, I can. That's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my first ever lecture. It was in the uh, in that room over there. So I hope this isn't my last. I hope we have a full circle. That got me worried there. But uh, yeah, uh, that was a long time ago. I should add also that uh, in that year, in those years when I was finishing my PhD and I came to Florence and I was looking for, for work, uh, I couldn't speak Italian very well at all. Uh, it was really poor. And I had to do some work in the archives. I had to read some books. I had to do some research properly. And so I did what every every penniless student does. Uh, I just tried to make friends who have uh, conversation partners. So I put a very colorful advert in a bookshop window. I painted a big Union Jack to catch the eye with felt tip pens. And uh, I put my number on there and I said, you know, are you, uh, are you an Italian student trying to learn English? I'm an English student trying to learn Italian. And I got some phone calls and I made some friends. And that's how I met my wife. There you go. You could see where this was going. Uh, she, she wasn't my wife at the time, but uh, we got married a few years later, and uh, that also explains why I'm still in Italy after all the years. And uh, she was from Prato, and that's why I live in Prato. But uh, I was coming to Florence on a daily basis, working very happily in Florence back then. So, uh, yes, this place has a very special place for me. So uh, I'm delighted to be uh, well invited back to talk again. So that's great. Thank you very much. A uh, couple of apologies first. First of all, for the something happened to my font. That's my fault. I've got this kind of true crime look to my font up there. I'm not sure what the kind of micro dot or something like that, but as long as it's legible, we'll be okay. Uh, I should also say from the intro, you might have guessed that uh, my focus has actually always been on the Italian Renaissance. So painting, sculpture, architecture too, and not necessarily on the topic of today's talk, which is looking at the Italian Renaissance through the lens of 19th century artists, particularly painters. So I'm looking at a what is a very familiar topic for me through a historical lens, um, and we'll see how far we get with that. I'm sure you're all familiar with a lot of the raw material of the Italian Renaissance. If you, if you live in Florence or you visited Florence, or you've been drawn to its art. And uh, some of the 19th century images we'll look at as well will, uh, of course, look very familiar, I'm sure, to a lot of you. Um, so first of all, to explain this rather uh, bold title I have here, that the Renaissance was somehow invented through painting. Uh, I'm not here to say that the Renaissance didn't happen. It actually did happen. Uh, I'm not suggesting it didn't. But the way that we imagine the Renaissance and the way that we define it and the way that we process it collectively in our cultures, and there are many cultures, of course, has changed over time and it will continue to change into the future. Painters, like writers and historians, have played a major role in interpreting and delivering the Renaissance to us after so much time. Um, painters in the 19th century, I, I suspect, in particular, have a massive hand in shaping our contemporary vision of the Italian Renaissance. And now, as the 19th century began, uh, traditionally, the only historical sources that could be used as a subject of painting or history painting, as it was called, were the worlds of classical antiquity and the Bible. During the 19th century, however, the Italian Renaissance becomes increasingly popular as a topic in Western art. Uh, and that's part of a, an intense romantic return to the past, which characterizes many 19th century cultural movements, romanticism, the romantics. And it's a trend that permeated much of the century. And we can see signs of that in, in practically every European country. Um, as a consequence, and not just in the Renaissance either, but as a consequence, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance began to be valid topics for painting. We see that begin in the 19th century and 
towards the end of the 19th, 19th century, that ceases to be the case. So something happens to, to stimulate this growth of topic, and then something happens towards the end uh, where it just sort of peters out to a certain extent. Uh, remember, the 19th century was the century of Jacob Burkhardt and many other historians who uh, battled among themselves to define the Renaissance. Burkhardt's book, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, came out in 1860. Many art historians or many students of art history have given that book, even today, to look at the origins of our modern conception of what the Renaissance is. Uh, that's one example. The, the consequences of that book, uh, I would say, are an example of the ill-defined and still uncertain identity of the Italian Renaissance at that time, but even still today. Uh, just look at, for example, at the way that some historians would prefer not even to use the word Renaissance, but would rather say early modern. So there is still debate about how we should frame and identify the period that we're talking about. A lot of the sources were written. The written word came before painting in a lot of the works we're looking at. New material was made available to artists who wanted to know about the Renaissance by a growing number of written sources all around Europe. Uh, also, there was a massive uh, boom in the production and dissemination of information through uh, the fields of printing, mass communications, magazines, periodicals, everything is on the rise, meaning that that flow of information in writing about the Renaissance was arriving at more people and more rapidly. And in fact, the painters we look at here today very often resorted to those episodes that were already um, well known and guaranteed by that mass production of info. Rarely, in fact, did they represent characters and events which had not already reached the attention of a sufficient number of people through the popular media. Um, and we should also mention the word historicism here before we go any further. This is an enthusiasm for scenes and anecdotes derived from historical writing. Today, pretty outmoded, pretty unfashionable these days, uh, but it's an often little understood aspect of romantic painting. Historical paintings or history paintings um, belong to this genre. Uh, they live, they often, I'm afraid to say, live in museum basements or they're relegated to rooms that people don't go to uh, or in reserve collections. As I discovered when I first became curious about this type of painting, they, they really are deeply unfashionable in some circles. Uh, we should mention also the word antiquarianism. There's another ism, of course, um, of equal importance to the, to the elements in the genesis of these works. There was a huge antiquarian taste in the 19th century for collecting historical objects typical of various historical periods. Um, for example, uh, scenes in which the uh, Sforza family of Milan, let me just move through to my first slide, if I can manage that. There we go. Scenes in which, and we'll come back to this painting uh, later on, we talk about the Sforza and the Medici, but just throw one up here as I talk about some of the introductory principles. Many of the scenes we're going to look at today um, rarely propose dramatic events. Um, instead, they consist of court interiors, scenically arranged with meticulous attention to clothing, to furniture, and ornaments. This particular one is uh, Lorenzo de' Medici. I wonder if you could guess. This is Lorenzo de' Medici. Uh, in his house, introducing Ludovico il Moro of the Sforza family, who's sitting in front of him, to his beautiful home and his wonderful collections, and all of the people in his house dressed in wonderful costumes. You know, the detail, the detail is, is immense. There's something to look at absolutely everywhere. And that's a reflection of the contemporary taste in antiquarianism. It has to be. Um, also, a lot of these scenes, and let's have another little backdrop there. I think, you know, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not surprised it's unfashionable anymore. These are quite, these can be quite shocking to the modern eye. Um, they sometimes appear to be very much, you know, the, the, I don't know, the triumph of style of a substance, something very stylish about these interiors and costumes. Many of them were inspired, again, as I said, by literature, historical literature, but also by the works of uh, Walter Scott and his imitators throughout Europe had a massive effect. Um, uh, his writing included uh, many detailed visual descriptions of historical sets and uh, environments. So much of the minutiae of these paintings uh, derived from sources on medieval and Renaissance clothing as well, such as, just give you one example, French work by Bonnard and Mercury called Costume Historique, which was published in the 1820s. Um, one of many examples we can look at. Uh, much of the content was actually intentionally anachronistic, so not historically researched, 
uh, in the way that we would expect it today. And it reflected the taste for neo-Renaissance ornamentation. This is another label you find to describe a lot of the interiors we're going to look at, neo-Renaissance. So very knowingly a recreation of Renaissance interiors, not using original Renaissance pieces. And sometimes the paintings of the time reflect that taste in modern furniture rather than the original thing. Um, here's another page from that one. I wish I had a copy of that. Fantastic illustrations. Um, let's go north for a second to Milan. I don't know if any of you have visited the amazing Bagatti Valsetti Museum. Okay, see if a few nods to the heads here. I hadn't until a couple of years ago. Um, an amazing museum. The Bagatti Valsetti House in Milan was built by uh, the Barons Fausto and Giuseppe Bagatti Valsetti. And uh, so it's a new home. They built this in the early 19th century. They were both so passionate uh, of, in all things neo medieval and neo Renaissance that they lined this modern home with everything they could get their hands on from the original Middle Ages and Renaissance, but also commissioned from local craftsmen and artists in Milan, uh, imitations or copies or modern works influenced by the Italian Renaissance. The house is now a museum. Uh, they love dressing up, of course. We could have a whole lecture just about how they love to get uh, dressed up. And they used to dress up in costumes. They had loads of costumes made for them. The whole family joined in. They used to imitate whole altarpieces. They used to do these tableaux vivants together as well. They, you know, that was their idea of a great night in, dressing up in the Renaissance style. But you've got to see their house. If you haven't been to the house, it's in the city center of Milan. It's in the uh, fashion district. And it is just amazing. Let's have a look at a few of these rooms. Um, stunning rooms. You do, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the Palazzo d'Avanzati across the river here in uh, Florence. But um, this was done, of course, much more recently uh, and richly, you know, wall to wall, horror vacui. Absolutely. There's not a bare inch of bare space from the floor to the ceiling. Everything is beautifully dripping. Uh, again, it may not be our taste today, but it's a uh, it also reflects what we might call in the United Kingdom the Victorian taste for, you know, fullness, busyness, clutter, which is a loaded term, of course, but, but very, very full. This is one of the uh, living rooms in the Bagatti Valsecchi. Uh, last time I visited, they were using it for a uh, fashion show as well. So they had modern costumes on display in these old rooms, which is great. Here's one of the bedrooms. Here we have some original Renaissance artworks hanging on the walls, but much of it is near Renaissance. Um, and beautifully put together. Um, here's another view of the what I think was a kitchen, maybe originally. Extraordinary stuff for fireplaces too. And uh, can anybody guess what this room is? What is that thing in the middle of the room? No prizes for guessing what it is, but I wonder if you could guess. That's actually a shower, yeah, made of a white marble. And, you know, you stand inside it and there's taps and there's a hose on the top. Amazing stuff. So this is the bathroom. Uh, so all mod cons uh, for the barons as well. So a wonderful museum. Um, if you can visit that, absolutely go and do it. Um, okay, so um, the first manifestations of this phenomenon. Oh, I should say one thing I should say. Is there were critics at the time, of course, who said that a lot of this is just not historically accurate. Uh, books uh, like the costume book uh, were targets. Uh, from some historians who said, this is just not historically accurate. This is genre. This is not history. It's still not backed up by fact. And the interiors of these uh, houses sometimes came with a bit of criticism too. But the, uh, the barons were enjoying themselves. So why not? Uh, the first manifestations of uh, this uh, movement or phenomenon, uh, this passion for the Renaissance over again, uh, did occur in Italy. And we're talking around 1820. And um, I started in Milan because the passion almost exclusively arose in centers such as Milan, Florence, and Venice, places which could boast a particularly significant Renaissance experience, a real one, an initial one, and of which there was solid documentation as well. And paintings of the genre had a, also had a very political value, as they invariably contained veiled allusions to open, sore issues of contemporary Italy, which were independence and patriotism and freedom. Uh, they inspired a lot of the Renaissance painting we're looking at. For example, let's stay in Milan. And uh, you know, really, when I first started taking an interest in these paintings, it was hard to find reproductions of them. You know, years later, the internet has developed so much, uh, it doesn't take much Googling 
find lots and lots of photographs of these history paintings. Uh, so I could show you thousands, but I won't. Um, take a few examples. Uh, Leonardo presents a sketch of a last supper to the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Moro, 1846, by Francesco Adesti. Um, so in Milan, the painters celebrated the exploits of the Visconti and the Sforza, the ruling families that are the subjects of most of these paintings. They were almost all created and exhibited in the circles of the Brera Academy, almost all commissioned and owned by the Lombard middle class and upper bourgeoisie. So there's nothing revolutionary about this painting. It's very much of the institution and supporting a vision of the institution. Um, one of the most uh, famous uh, pairings you find in this painting, most common one, is uh, this relationship between Leonardo and uh, the Duke Ludovico in Moro. Uh, they keep cropping up together in this painting. Leonardo has either come to uh, Ludovico and showing him a drawing or a sketch, or as we'll see in a moment, uh, the Duke actually goes to the studio or church where Leonardo's working, and Leonardo actually shows him something. But they're always very closely related as, as a couple in, a, in this uh, agency between the two. Um, this was stimulated partly, of course, by the strong attraction of Leonardo da Vinci in the 19th century. He was already starting to be seen as a modern man. This was also a result of the massive boost in uh, printing and circulation and facsimiles of a lot of his drawings and works, which had never been circulated before. Uh, but what the artists were really interested in, primarily, was celebrating the cultural goals of Lombardy and the whole region. Because remember, these were artists sponsored by the institution. Um, and in 18, uh, I'll give you another example. Ooh, ooh, how about this one? I promised you that sometimes Ludovico got up out of his chair and went to Leonardo. Now here he is. Look at this one. Uh, people, people depict the relationship between the two in very different ways. These form part of a very familiar artist and protector model, which, uh, which is not unique to the 19th century. Um, you know, the benevolent, understanding, cultured benefactor who realizes the genius of, of his artist or her artist. And there we have Leonardo as well uh, explaining to the Duke. You know, uh, the, the Leonardo in this painting actually higher than the Duke, which I think is very significant as well. That's very unusual when we normally would see in a courtly situation, the lessers stand and the, uh, you know, the superiors are sitting. But here we have great uh, accolade, you know, great, uh, great treatment for Leonardo, who's actually on a higher step as well. So the Duke subordinating himself to the genius of the artist. You know, what artist would not paint something like that? It's obviously in favor of the artists themselves as well. You can see how these kinds of paintings actually promote the status of the artist who painted them themselves, perhaps dreaming of a similar relationship with his own patrons, if only. Um, but then some artists did it a bit differently. Uh, here's a, a really tawdry uh, reproduction, I must apologize, but it's very hard to find some of the originals. Some are lost, some just can't get good copies of them. Uh, Gonin's uh, uh, original painting was of Ludovico Mora, Leonardo da Vinci. Now, we're still, in the, uh, we're still in the refectory where the Last Supper was. You remember, you could see it here at the top right, just out of shot. But here we have it now. It's over on the left up here. It's hardly featured at all. Now we're focusing on the relationship between Leonardo and the Duke. But Leonardo here is depicted um, as, a, as a, well, you know, the Duke is no longer a deferential and uh, friendly patron, I think, in awe of Leonardo. Here we've got um, Leonardo as an obsequious member of the court, bowing, doing a bit of bowing and scraping as he goes towards the Duke. So a very different relationship. And maybe that's because Gonin was more closely connected with Piemonte, where the House of Savoy was more... Um, had a current and contemporary system of hierarchy and courtly behavior, which may be fueled Gonin's ideas rather than 19th century Milan. Um, anyway, staying with Milan, a clear intention of these, words, of these works was to remind Italians that Milan aspired to propose itself as an epicenter of national pride. There's another example, go back to one that we started with, the court of Ludovico Moro. Um, it could do so, Milan could uh, propose itself as an epicenter of national pride, because it had already been a prestigious place for the Renaissance civilization. And you can start doing who's who, I think it's all of these paintings, everybody's been identified. We've got uh, Leonardo on the, on the right. Uh, we have, uh, we probably have uh, Bramante, who's the figure in the green, slightly to left. 
uh, we probably have, um, uh, you know, ident well, there are identified figures throughout the court. These are well-known members of the Milanese court. Um, the desire at the time was for independence from, Austrian, from the Austrian yoke. That was the main motivation underlying this genre of paintings. It was destined, they said, Milan was destined in these paintings for a future importance in the unified Italy, precisely because it would have been the natural extension of the power the city had had in the Renaissance era. Okay, let's go southwards, have a look at what's going on in Tuscany, Florence. Um, this is a, an engraving of the Villa Medici at Careggi, of course, now uh, in the area of the modern hospital. Uh, here also in the second decade of the 19th century, many new paintings hark back to the moments of Renaissance history of the city of Florence. And is it in the case of Lombardy, here too, the pressing issues look at the future of Italy. And once again, the inspiration for the development of themes came directly from an environment of writers and intellectuals. The painters of Florentine history drew inspiration not only from modern studies, but also from the numerous and well-known period accounts. Uh, Villani, Machiavelli, Guicciardini, there's just so much information, so much material. Furthermore, thanks to the success of many foreign authors who were interested in Florence, as opposed to Milan, there's greater interest in Florence. So we've got Roscoe, uh, Musse, Duma, Balzac, countless events and characters from the city's history were accessible to a good number of foreign artists and patrons, not just Italians. So Lombards painted the Renaissance Milan, but the whole world painted Renaissance Florence. I should say the Western world. There's just so much more material. Uh, one of the most fruitful subjects was that of the Medici family. Um, often celebrated for the contribution they made to the arts rather than in any specific political guise. Uh, one example is the extensive series of Medici subjects commissioned around 1850 for this villa uh, from Antonio Puccinelli, teacher of painting at the Foreign Academy, by Sir Francis Joseph Sloan for his new home, Villa Medici in uh, Careggi. And the scenes included, and again, apologize. Uh, reproductions here, sometimes in black and white too. Some of the frescoes uh, in the house depicted scenes like this. Cosimo Il Vecchio welcoming writers and artists in his studio. Again, a very antiquarian attention to the decor, furniture and the costumes, but a real focus on Cosimo as a patron of the arts. And you can see in a lot of these paintings how 19th century painters borrowed some of the portraiture and details from other well-known original Renaissance paintings. This, for example, is Pontormo's portrait of Cosimo Il Vecchio, which is in the Uffizi of Cerva, and uh, that's clearly the source for Puccinelli's vision of Cosimo there, seated, of course, according to the hierarchy of the day. Um, okay, here's another example from that series. Lorenzo the Magnificent hosting readings of Plato in Rome. Um, and there are so many. There are so many from around this period, the 1850s. Um, a confirmation uh, of the intent, international popularity of these kinds of paintings is that many of them, uh, and we've got good records of which paintings won prizes at the annual salons and exhibitions around Europe, uh, paintings featuring the Medici often won prizes. So they're a very well-known and popular type of painting. There's uh, another example, uh, Mussini's prize-winning painting. Sorry about the text again, something happened there. Uh, Lorenzo Medici celebrated Plato's birthday again out in the garden, surrounded by orators and poets. Um, wonderful attention again to costumes, very idealistic view. Um, many of these were inspired uh, specifically by the life of Lorenzo Medici, written by William Roscoe of Liverpool, whose uh, biography was translated and became uh, international fodder for artists and patrons who wanted to know more about the daily life of the Medici. Um, one of the most bizarre ones, and we looked at it earlier on, is this uh, uh, the clash of the titans, really. In the 1860s, Amos Cassioli decided to bring together both Florence and Milan in a single image, which normally wasn't done. It's quite unusual. One. So we have Lorenzo de' Medici showing um, uh, uh, the Sforza Duke, his collection of art furnishings. Uh, painted in Milan, uh, Cassioli's canvas won a prize at the National Government Competition in Florence. Um, and, and again, as I said before, that's quite typical. This style of painting was a prize winner as well. It seemed to do well um, among the judges and juries of these exhibitions, not just the general public. Um, so the, the idea of the cultured and sumptuously furnished environments of the 15th century Medici court led to many 
idealized pictorial expressions of the magnificence of the Renaissance. So the Medici have a lot to answer for and as, as a source for a lot of these paintings. Um, and in Tuscany, eminent foreign personalities such as Horn, Temple Leader, and Stibbert, inspired more by this type of painting than from an exact perception of reality, were part of the trend of recreating neo-Renaissance interiors in the houses and villas, sometimes looking very much at these paintings rather than the real object, if you see what I mean. So powerful and seductive were these images at the time. Um, the first ever indication in Florence of this interest in Florentine history came way back in the 1820s when uh, Giuseppe Bezzuoli uh, painted a very successful painting, the entry of Charles VIII into Florence, the French king uh, entering Florence at the end of the 15th century. Uh, in 1494, observed by a crowd of alarmed citizens, lots of alarmed Florentines here, as the French king saunters in, looking very proud, very shiny, uh, and there are some uh, identifiable portraits. Even Machiavelli is over in the corner there, looking particularly worried about what's happening. This one was created uh, following the return to power of the Lorena dynasty, who had returned to Florence after 15 years of Napoleonic rule. And it's easy to understand how Bezzuoli put the Lorenas on the same level as the Medici, indicating them as uh, legitimate sovereigns, uh, clearly equating Napoleon with Charles VIII, both French usurpers. Uh, in fact, the painting was first commissioned and then purchased by Grand Duke Leopold II himself. So very successful with the institutions as well. This is what they wanted to see. Uh, one of the themes implied in Bezzuoli's canvas, namely the political legitimacy of the Medici. Uh, so let's say that again, political legitimacy of the Medici. It's, however, found in a very relatively small number of paintings. It's very hard to find them um, in the course of the century. Um, it's, we're more likely to find, as we've seen already, celebrations of the Medici as cultural champions, but not legitimate political rulers. Uh, let's take, for example, back at the Villa Medici in Correggi, there's a fresco by George Frederick Watts called The Doctor's Punishment, which relates the punishment meted out to Lorenzo de' Medici's doctor after he failed to keep Lorenzo alive. So they killed him. So I'm sorry if there are any doctors here tonight. I'm sorry about that, but you know, he didn't just get struck off. They drowned him in a well. Um, as punishment for, you know, for misdiagnosing, mistreating Lorenzo. Um, and this, this really, I think, uh, tells you about a post-Laurentian age, which is dark and corrupt and evil. The kind of thing that was uh, coming out of uh, Roscoe's books about the Medici as well. Um, still from this particular period, we've got the landing of Lorenzo the Magnificent in Naples. So Lorenzo gets a better press than most of the Medici. Uh, but after Lorenzo's epoch, we don't get much celebration of any political legitimacy at all. Um, the landing of Lorenzo the Magnificent in Naples is taken from um, Machiavelli's Florentine Histories, response to the same laudatory theme. Uh, Grand Duke Leopold I, always eager to see himself associated with the pre-1494 family of the Medici, purchased it in 1855. So that goes into collection as well. Boom, in it goes. Um, some pictorial representations of the Patsy conspiracy. And I bet some of you are thinking, well, there must be some great pictures of the Patsy conspiracy. All that blood, uh, knives, the church, what a great setting. You know, you couldn't have written it. Uh, well, some pictorial representations of the Patsy conspiracy went so far as to depict Lorenzo in a heroic light, bravely struggling with his failed assassins in the cathedral. Not sure if that actually happened, but we have Lorenzo wrestling in a few images. But most uh, are simply bent on showing a good fight in a dramatic setting. And there's a few good examples. Um, and the one on the right there, just a reminder that small books, cheap pamphlets, illustrated histories became very popular. These were mass produced. And there's a little glimpse of that genre of uh, visual communication there as well. Um, so, uh, the, but the relative, scarce, the relative scarcity of works portraying a member of the Medici family as an ideal ruler rather than an ideal patron, suggests how 19th century patrons and artists generally prefer to overlook the despotic connotations of Medician authority. The more sympathetic vision of the Medici, prompted by, promoted by Roscoe, had given way during the 19th century 
to writers with a more Republican bent, like Sismondi, who in successful works told the story of harsh political oppression. Um, even Betzwoli, in his very successful image of Carlo the Eighth, Charles the Eighth, entering Florence, seems to realize that to stand on solid ideological ground, it was better to present the French king as an invader rather than directly placing the Medici family in a favorable light. And the paintings that address subsequent generations of the Medici, pretty negative. Uh, they focus a lot on uh, an unequivocally negative aura. Uh, uh, lots of assassinations. That's great fodder for the 19th century painters. They're great fun. Uh, assassinations of a Duke Alessandro, various versions there for you. Um, he's getting, uh, you know, it seems to have happened in many different ways. Uh, the family is associated here with uh, oppression and intrigue and, uh, you know, very dramatic, very sad, but maybe this is just, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. Likewise, there was great interest in lots of other particular cameos and biographies. People like Bianca Capello, biographies, stories about her were uh, intriguing and shocking, and there are a lot of paintings as well and illustrations of of those particular lives. Um, it was also uh, possible for some painters to find the true political heroes in the Medici's opponents. So there are some uh, frescoes and illustrations that shows members of the Pazzi family, uh, the Strozzi family, uh, Francesco Ferrucci, celebrated as, as defenders of freedom. And there's a series of those frescoes that were commissioned by the Savoia in the Pitti Palace, of which I don't have illustrations. Okay, let's move on to the apps. If you're looking for the arch enemy of the 15th century Medici, who are you going to go for, apart from the other families? Who's it going to be? Well, it's going to be Savonarola. Savonarola provided great, uh, great uh, material for 19th century painters. Uh, without doubt, the most bitter political adversary, if you look at these paintings, uh, the Dominican friar, Girolamo Savonarola, uh, was rediscovered due to the popularity of the new French and Italian books about him, um, in which the political system, the republic that he established, was presented as a heroic undertaking. So if you're a fan of the Medici, look away. Okay, It's not a good, uh, not a good press come on. Um, in England, he, he gained renewed fame uh, in the 1860s, thanks to the success, uh, success of Romola by George Eliot. Uh, with illustrations by none other than Lord Leighton. It's a lovely uh, early copy with a view through the arches of the Ponte Vecchio, which I just wanted to show you. I thought that was great. And then uh, an image of uh, Savonarola himself, um, looking rather despotic there, but I don't know. But, you know, generally uh, rediscovered in a positive light in, these, uh, in the text and the images of these books. Uh, almost all of Savonarola's representations 19th century are inspired by the dramatic events in these kinds of texts. The preaching, uh, the presence of Lorenzo de' Medici's deathbed, I've got a few of those coming up, his arrest, his imprisonment, and his subsequent death by execution. All such good material. Uh, one of the best examples, and we'll get there in a moment, but obviously it wasn't the first time that Savonarola had been depicted as a, as a popular preacher. This is actually from Savonarola's time, a woodcut from the 15th century, showing how he filled the Duomo with some of his very popular sermons. Notice the little pole and sheet down the middle of the nave of the cathedral here. Men on one side, women on the other. And there he is, preaching away, flailing his hands. That gesture uh, seems to crop up in many of these pictures. Not here to talk about gestures, but it looks very familiar. You see it cropping up. Let's have a look at a, an example from the 19th century. Um, a German painter who gave a seminar on the preaching against prodigality, uh, so uh, denouncing frivolous possessions, activities. Uh, this is the preparation for the famous bonfire of the vanities, which happened, which he organized in the Piazza della Signoria. Um, let's have a look at another one here. Uh, but by the way, again, in almost so many of these paintings, you look in the far right hand corner. There's some very concerned Florentines. There always are in so many of these pictures. A group of people say, well, hang on a sec. You know, where, does this, where does this leave us? So there's, you know, there's kind of a little cliche, but you keep getting these. And there are many other elements we could look at too. But that's one of those staple ingredients. You might even spot, I'm not sure if my mouse is visible here. No, but over on the right there, in that group of people, uh, there are some faces actually drawn from famous 
Florentine portraits as well from the 15th century. So a mixture, sort of historical imagination and images from Renaissance paintings, uh, which, which, which we could sit here and unpick, you know, over and over again with all of these paintings. Um, according to tradition, oh, here's another one. There you go. Savonarola being arrested. See what a tragedy that was? Everybody weeping and trying to, you know, stay. And no, no, I've got to go. So off he walks. The guards waiting at the door. So it's a heroic surrender to the authorities as a martyr. Um, now, there's also a very famous 15th and later 16th century copy of the scene of Savonarola's execution, which is a genuine Renaissance painting. This is one version of it. And uh, many of the uh, engravings and paintings drew from that setting as well. There is a lot of got a lot of information about how uh, he was taken to the scaffold and how he was uh, burned alive with two of his followers. So there's plenty of material for this. And, uh, you know, they really had, they really had long legs and uh, traveled a lot. Um, one of the uh, most um, uh, famous incidents of this relationship between Savonarola and Lorenzo de' Medici is according to, to tradition that Lorenzo deserved moral and political infamy for having refused on the point of death, and despite the pleading of Savonarola, to grant freedom to the people. You know, I will hear your confession uh, if you grant freedom to the people of Florence. And he pointed outside the window, them out. And Lorenzo refused. Uh, and if by doing so, Lorenzo shows an inflexible despotism in these paintings, here's another version. Lorenzo recoiling from the idea of giving, you know, sort of now turning around and, you know, a, a final benevolent uh, moment of release to the people, you know, acknowledge your despotism. Uh, no. Uh, so if Lorenzo looks bad every time that this happens, Savonarola, on the other hand, when he refuses to sign a transcript of his confession extorted under torture, it reveals instead his heroic determination. So it's very much stacked in favor of Savonarola, a lot of these paintings. Um, and there are lots of these paintings of Savonarola in prison, refusing to play ball with the authorities. Um, towards the end of the century, Savonarola grew even more uh, in uh, his stature, grew even more, due to the fact that in some cases, he was considered as the direct precursor of Martin Luther. In turn, ideally seen as the first victim of the post-reformist church. Uh, so here we have to take account also of a couple of other isms, uh, well, at least one an important ism of the 19th century, which is anti-clericalism as well, and anti-Catholicism in some countries, found, uh, and, and that found literary and pictorial expression in characters such as Semarola in Venice, in characters like Paolo Sarpi and Galileo, who were also victims of Catholic dogmatism, according to many. Uh, by the way, what about Giordano Bruno? Don't have many images of Giordano Bruno, even though you think, well, why not? Surely that's good material along the same lines. But there's a relative absence to this. As far as I can see, it could be that we don't see lots of uh, Giordano Bruno's suffering, uh, maybe because in the 19th century, there was a relative lack of studies and biographies about him. Um, so I, that could just confirm the crucial role that texts play in giving painters and patrons something that they can work from and something that the public would recognize. If it's not a widely disseminated biography, the painting's not going to resonate. Um, okay, let's go up north again to Venice. Um, one of my favorite painters, the great romantic 19th century painter, Francesco Hayez, director of the Brera Academy, uh, described by Mazzini as the head of the School of Historical Painting, and still today a very popular painter. Um, a good dose of inspiration to Hayats and other Venetian paintings was provided by the Renaissance history of Venice. No surprise there. Um, take this one, for example, uh, Pietro Rossi taken prison, prisoner by the Scaligeri. This is a, a bit of medieval Venetian history, but uh, basically depicts a man heroically going, uh, answering the call of the state to go to fight despite the pleading of his wife his children who are crying, no, don't go, don't go, but he's a heroic man, he's going to go and do this. It's basically what the story is about here. It comes at a time when uh, it was important to transmit, uh, because of contemporary questions in Northern Italy, uh, patriotic feelings. So it's a very, very patriotic painting. Um, that was the intention. 
Most of the paintings that have Venetian history as their subject focus, though, on the negative history, uh, the negative myth, if you like, of the city of Venice as a place of oppression, of intrigue, and ruinous passions. So both Italians and foreigners continuously portrayed scenes and events popularized by writers such as Byron, which gave an image of Venice as a place of corruption and incurable cruelty. For example, um, final moments of Doge Marin Faliero on the Del Piombo staircase, um, and the story of the two Foscari as well, um, were common topics in this time as well. The two Foscari, uh, a historical tragedy, is a verse play written in five acts by Lord Byron. There's a little snapshot of a frontispiece there. Uh, a plot set in Venice in the mid 15th century. It's loosely based on the true story of the downfall of one of the Doges, Francesco Foscari, and his son Jacopo. Uh, Byron's play formed also the basis of Verdi's opera, I Due Foscari. So, so these are really well known uh, uh, products across the whole of Europe, translated into multiple languages. So paintings that would uh, had a lot of international patrons and uh, did the right thing by choosing something they would recognize here. So not celebrating the uh, political identity of Venice or Venice's claim to a front to a chair at modern Italian, the modern Italian table, you know, the unified nation, but uh, focusing instead on the negative aspects of uh, Venetian life, unfortunately. Um, okay, let's have a look at something else. Let's have a look at, uh, well, it's kind of a halfway conclusion, if you like. We've seen that these representations of the Italian Renaissance were not born simply from the romantic desire to recreate uh, with the imagination a lost age, but they were fueled by the desire to draw the line of demarcation between present and past. They were often used to propose a future based on idealized historical paradigms. It's not just nostalgia. The past was attributed a political stance, and the Italian Renaissance represented a mine of exemplary case studies both revolutionary and conservative, depending on what you chose to depict and how you depicted it. Uh, what's more, I think by, by depicting scenes, uh, historical events, the artists also had a filter that allowed them to deal with hot topics in acceptable ways that were less likely to be censored. So hot topics, uh, I think, is something we, you know, anachronistic term, but certainly a lot of these things were, despite the, what these paintings look like at first glance, they're really, really hot. Okay, let's move outside of Italy for a second. Uh, what was going on around the world? Well, it was harder for a foreign painter. I, I use foreign very loosely, uh, non-Italians. If non-Italians were painting for non-Italian publics, how much did non-Italians know about the intricacies of Italian history? How much did they care about the Italian fight for independence and freedom? Much less, of course, than Italians. Um, it was probably, you know, rather than seeing Italian history as a source of nationalistic symbols, uh, I think most foreigners saw the uh, Italian history as a succession of rivalries and divisions instead. Uh, in Germany, France, and England, there's a new interest in the Renaissance, as there had been for a return of the Gothic, but it meant that each of those countries found its renewed passion for its own history, rather than looking at the Italian Renaissance. So Shakespeare, for example, is a huge topic in the middle 19th century in uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, all serial reproductions of scenes from his plays. Millions of them were produced during this period. Um, Nevertheless, the pictorial representation of the Italian Renaissance exerted a charm on foreigners. So there are a lot of paintings like this one by August Gendron, which depicts an idyllic setting uh, in a typical uh, Toscan villa. Um, in places like England, um, there was, of course, uh, we have all, um, eventually, of course, a revival of um, painting styles and materials, and that pre-Raphaelite movement as well. We'll come back to them in a minute. Uh, for Americans, I know we have some Americans in the house, Italy's greatest seduction for much of the world of the 19th century consisted not in its Renaissance history, but in the fact that it had been uh, the location of ancient Rome. So it's classical, antique Italy that exerted more power on the American public than anything uh, the Renaissance. I think Americans at that time found the Italian Renaissance just a bit too foreign to return a full range of figures to the history paper. Um, Illustrious men was a common uh, theme throughout the whole of Europe. Famous men in settings like libraries or institutions or, or uh, state buildings. And a lot of Italians popped up there too. Galileo, Machiavelli, Dante. But the most famous Renaissance figure 
I wonder if you can guess. Who, what kind of person was most depicted over and over again by Italian and foreign painters alike? It was artists, Italian Renaissance artists. More uh, quantitatively here than any other category we can find. A lot of the material comes from, obviously, Giorgio Vasari, his famous Lives of the Artists, published in the 1550s for the first time. But by the 19th century, there were lots of other alternative sources as well, giving artists all around the world and patrons um, access to some great stories. Now, I did a kind of a popularity poll for you, and I can announce the results. Uh, number one, in at number one, uh, in number three, I should say, I'm giving you the top three. In number three, the artist seen as a precocious young man um, giving proof of his extraordinary talent in front of other people who look just, at, you know, or in awe. Like, wow, look at that. You know, this, this can, this just, there's just thousands of these. Um, one of the most famous, one of the most familiar, familiar to Italians especially as well, is uh, Sabatelli's image of Cimabue and Giotto, taken straight from Vasari. Cimabue is going down the street, spots this young ragged shepherd boy who's doing such a great sketch on a rock with a stone of a sheep. He says, come with me, my boy, I'll make you famous, and the rest is history. Um, now, uh, great story, but why is it a great story? It's because it's a paradigm of the typical pedagogical method of an institution such as the academy, which is how art was taught and learned in the 19th century. This is a cry for the liberty and success of the academy system. Uh, give you another example. Let's go outside of Italy and go to uh, London, uh, where for many years, hanging at the top of the stairs of the National Gallery, I think it's in a different room now, there's this huge painting by Lord Leighton, got him back again, uh, Cimabue's celebrated Madonna. Actually, it has a very long time. It says that it's um, Cimabue walking through the streets with his student uh, Giotto in his hand, and they're marching towards a church where the canvas, where the panel painting that Cimabue has just uh, painted is going to be delivered. A uh, bit of a misidentification. The panel painting is actually by Duccio. People have worked out. But uh, anyway, the conceit is the same. This is about the master and the pupil. There's, uh, we, there's a lot of other Florentines, famous artists, and Dante who can be spotted in the procession coming along there as well. By the way, this is 17 feet long, and it was so popular, Ruskin praised it to the heavens, and Queen Victoria bought it. So if there's a thread that connects all of these paintings, they were very successful. Um, uh, in at number two, in our chart of popular topics, uh, the second one would be the visit of an illustrious personality to the artist's studio. Uh, or the meeting between two great masters, you know, Raphael bumping into Michelangelo, or, or what, you know, whatever you want. There are, there are hundreds of these versions. Uh, but the, uh, and, and we'll have a look at a few versions here. I'm, I'm keeping number one to myself for a second. You might guess what it is, but here's, here's something which is quite interesting. In Florence, of course, uh, depictions from Vasari often focused on Brunelleschi. There's some famous anecdotes. This famous one where Brunelleschi uh, challenged the Opera del Duomo to balance an egg. Uh, you know, can you do that? And he said, no, of course we can't do that. So he brought the egg down with a, with a tap. It splattered. It stood up on the table with egg oozing everywhere. And they said, well, you know, if you told us how to do it, we would have done that. And they say, exactly. If I tell you how to build the dome, you'll go ahead and build it as well. So these, this, this is not just a history painting. It's a conversation piece as well. Because every time somebody stands in front of it, they, they do what I just did and talk about the story. Because somebody says, what's going on? So the conversation pieces too. And I found some more Florentines looking concerned in the corner. Can you see them as well? <laughs> every time. And I suppose this is the commentator. This is you, I, you know, to be serious about it. This is a common device, which we've seen since the Italian Renaissance of the commentator on the narrator. That bridges the gap between the viewer and the topic. It's got a halfway house for us to occupy. But in at number one, the most common uh, topic uh, of depicting, depicting artists was the death or the agony of an artist before his death. And I've got you know, so many again, but I've just had to pick a, the cream of the crop, really, in no particular order. Lord Nathan's death of Brunelleschi in a very strange looking Florence. Uh, it looks a bit like, uh, I don't know, Morocco or Baghdad or something. Very exotic. That shows Lord Nathan's passion for Islamic architecture and style as well. Uh, if you haven't been to Lord Nathan's house in London, you must go. It's fantastic. Um, and the death of Masaccio, even. This one was hard to find. But even Masaccio died, and we don't know what happened, but there are stories about uh, poisoning, assassination, because he died at the age of 27. So that's a rather mysterious one. Um, but he dies so well, as you can see, you know, 
lurching back in a beautiful setting uh, of frescoes. Yeah. But one of the most common I found, coming from Prato as I do, one of the most uh, scandalous moments in Renaissance history was the, uh, the Carmelite friar, Filippo Lippi, who uh, ran off with one of the nuns he was supposed to be looking after while he was chaplain in a convent in Prato. And this, uh, the, the scenes of Filippo Lippi courting the nun, Lucrezia Lippi, is one of the most common as well. Uh, this, uh, they really enjoyed these scandalous images of the friar, not dressed as a friar very often, but trying to steal a kiss from this nun. Uh, yeah, I don't think you get away with these kinds of pictures today. There's something uh, very peculiar about these, but there's a lot of them um, straight from Vasari. But let's go to uh, probably the most common uh, image of death. It's the death of um, Raphael. Uh, this title should be honors rendered to Raphael on his deathbed. The most common, uh, the, the art, let's put it this way, the artist that dies the most in 19th century painting is Raphael. Um, uh, to attribute a special value to these scenes, first of all, was the French. Um, in huge numbers, they took possession of the myth of Raphael in the 19th century. They felt he absolutely uh, represented the French Academy and the values of the Academy. Um, it was inaugurated by the French and continued. Um, uh, described by Vasari. We know that his final altarpiece was put at the end of bed. You can see it on the right. We know that uh, we're told also that Michelangelo made appearances, a traditional story. Michelangelo popped in to see what was happening as well. In fact, the figure on the far right, as far as you can see, there's a little portrait of Michelangelo pointing up at the unfinished altarpiece. And of course, there's a Pope. Uh, another great, you know, what a great prestigious image for a, for a painter. The Pope comes to your deathbed. It's not actually dying in the arms of the Pope, but almost. And we'll see somebody die in the arms of a king in a minute, which is probably the best. Yeah, Leonardo, of course. So, you know, lots of Raphaels. Uh, Michelangelo always, you know, pops up in the background there. There is, again, Michelangelo lurking on the other side of the bed. Um, this is a British version, Henry Nelson O'Neill, uh, wonderfully placed in front of an open window. It looks like the uh, Vatican uh, Lodger or Gallery. Um, but... <clears throat> Excuse me. The most uh, the most popular death of all, probably statistically, outside of Raphael, will be Leonardo, who we are told by Vasari died in the arms of the French king. Uh, so this sealed it for the French of French artists. He died in the arms of the king. Uh, this exalts. So we've seen Leonardo being used to exalt the Sforza court in Lombardy, but used by the French as well because Leonardo spent his final years in France up until the late nineteenth century. France could boast the largest collection of artworks by Leonardo anywhere in the world, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Michelangelo himself uh, rarely appears, uh, but he did pop up in uh, by the mid 19th century. We sometimes Michelangelo romantics like to portray him as a solitary figure in his study, contemplating his work or struggling to complete a task. They like that image of Michelangelo. Classicists preferred to show him. Uh, to highlight the debt he owed to antiquity, portraying him next to some famous sculpture. This is the Belvedere Torso, from, which is now in the Vatican Museums. Uh, this one also shows Michelangelo helping a young man learn how to sculpt, right? Rather than not helping anybody. He's actually, <laughs> uh, he's actually helping somebody. So there's your academy again. This is very important. You've got to read that as the academy. Uh, Pupil-teacher relationship. Um, there are many others. Uh, I, I've seen one where you see Michelangelo looking after a dying servant, uh, uh, showing a, uh, being shown around the house of Lorenzo de' Medici, or as you saw an elderly sculptor teaching a young boy. Uh, and during the uh, prior to the um, um, unification of Italy, as Florence was jockeying for primacy, capital of Italy, Michelangelo is frequently shown as a transit patriot, helping to fortify the city of Florence. Uh, by the time the 1860s came and uh, Italy was unified and everything had been sorted out, <laughs> that's a, it's a, you know, not true. Um, uh, well, you know, Michelangelo kind of paled back into other kinds of um, uh, depictions. He no longer seemed to serve as a patriot by the time we go through to the 1860s. Okay, um, there were huge changes, of course. And I, can't, I can't finish without showing you this one is wonderful. There are so many. Uh, we would say today might be kind of kitsch images of Leonardo. You know, we're tracking through Vasari's book and we're told that, you know, maybe he had musicians to keep her happy. Somebody's got a little monkey down here on a chain to keep her amused. So we get all of these lovely 
uh, stories. Leonardo always dressed, of course, as an elderly man with his beret and his full velvet gown in his studio. Um, okay, let's just um, take a quick look at the 1860s again before we, we complete this. I'm conscious of the time here. Um, the, um, in the 1860s, something does change. And you see two different kinds of painting appearing at the same time. This is the beginning of the end. We have one of the most famous history paintings of all, The Expulsion of the Duke of Athens by Stefano Ussi, 1860. Uh, it's a moment of history from 1343, when the Florentines expelled from the city the tyrant Gualtieri di Brienne, Duke of Athens. They kicked him out, and that becomes a magical moment in Florentine independence, historically speaking. Um, and it applies to uh, the expulsion of contemporary foreigners uh, in Tuscany. And around the same time, we have Eduardo Borrani's vision of a woman sewing an Italian flag. Painted around the same time, this is just before the expulsion of the Lorraine Habsburg family from Tuscany. These are two contemporary images, both drawn, you know, one obviously, you know, steeped in medieval history, hundreds of hours of research and meticulous uh, antiquari antiquarianism going in here. But we have a very different approach by a realist, by a Machiaioli. These are, this is a very different approach with a very simple naturalistic image. The message is exactly the same. It's about liberty and freedom and independence. Um, the acceptance of this new style of painting uh, is part of the story of the end of the previous style of painting we're looking at so far, uh, history painting. We must also recognize that there were plenty of artists in the 19th century who were passionate about using or reusing Renaissance style and techniques, not just the events of the Renaissance. So there are many of these movements throughout Europe. The Nazarenes are one of the most famous, uh, formed in Germany, and they painted images like this, which followed not just the, uh, the topics of the original Italian Renaissance painting, but also the compositions, the paint, style, uh, so much. These are 19th century paintings, but they clearly inspired, as the Pre-Raphaelites were, by a lot of 15th century Quattrocento paintings. The work of Fra Angelico, for example, comes to mind. Uh, one of the most famous productions of, the, uh, of these neo-Renaissance products of the uh, Nazarenes was Friedrich Overbeck's Italy and Germany from 1828, where he uh, depicted uh, Italy and Germany as two allegorical figures. Uh, very much, again, if you look particularly at the backdrop, as a recreation of Italian paintings themselves. Okay, um, let's go forward again. Uh, let's go right to the end. Um, in the second half of the 19th century, clearly history painting was waning. Uh, official competitions like the Prix de Rome were losing uh, their status. Uh, the, the coveted prizes for history painting were, were meaning less. They were seeming rather anachronistic. Um, even artists who abandoned history painting though, like the Impressionists, uh, continued to receive stimuli for reproposing the imagery of the Italian Renaissance. And Manet's uh, Les Déjeuners sous l'herbe is a great example of that. Manet clearly merged two very well known Renaissance paintings to create his modern version of something. And it's Giorgione's The Tempest and Titian's The Pastoral Concert blended together. So uh, is he rejecting the Italian Renaissance? Is he showing his debt to it? But, but clearly, a uh, a collage, really, of inspirations, but painted in such a, a shocking way, very modern way. Um, here's another great example of that modernist debt to the Italian Renaissance in a deliberately provocative way. Manes Olympia, Olympia, clearly drawn from Titian's Venus of Abellino here in the uh, Uffizi. And then one of the pictures you saw on the first slide there, Marcel Duchamp, L-H-O-O-Q, which I'm assured if, it, if you say that properly, pronouncing the French alphabet properly, it sounds like something like she has got a hot ass. There you go. I don't know. I don't know. That's what some people who know French tell me. So it's a rude title, very rude. And uh, there she is. And it's uh, a poor, it's a very low quality postcard, kind of touristy thing. You get outside the Louvre and he's messed about with it. And he's, put a, he's done quite a few things with it. And he's stuck it together and written on it. And he's put in a little sort of, you know, goatee beard and a little handlebar mustache, uh, you know, popular with the surrealists of the time as well. Um, you know, it's, um, 
there, he was, wasn't the only artist who played around with the Mona Lisa. There are many others. Uh, Leger, Dali, Warhol. Uh, and it's a reminder of the process of commodification as well, which was popular at the time. But disfiguring a much loved image like this, uh, a contemporary artist makes an anti-artistic gesture, quite clearly. Uh, modern painters revealing the same concerns that gave rise to many of the portraits we saw earlier. Um, it's about professional identity. It's about status. And they're modern artists' inescapable but unsustainable relationship with the great masters. Um, we, we could also talk here about the way um, Duchamp hints at it here, the commodification of the Renaissance. Uh, suddenly, in the end of the 19th century, we see Renaissance imagery and artwork deployed by advertisers as well to sell products. That would be a different topic altogether. So I hope what I've showed uh, this evening is that it's wrong to believe that pictorial representations of the Renaissance in Italy, which just narrative illustrations, are always subordinate just to text. Uh, the images we've looked at today confirm what we already knew, that the 19th century vision of the Renaissance was plastic and malleable. Uh, it carries a lot of conflicting identities with it, uh, merged, diverged, and blended as we go through the century. One could better speak maybe of renaissances in plural for the 19th century. You know, one 19th century renaissance participates in great political debates about legitimacy, independence, nationalism, freedom. Another one was about religious and anti-clerical arguments. Another one appeared as evidence for arguing the status of artists. Uh, and, and we finished off with another one that seems to show how artists reject the renaissance altogether, but can't escape from it altogether. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. There's some light. Yeah. And now we'll move, as always, to the question and answer phase. Rules are the same as always. If in the room you want to uh, ask a question, make a comment, put your hand up, and I'll bring you the microphone so the people on the Zoom can hear you. Um, and if you're on the Zoom, and you can put something in the comments, and I'll read it out on your behalf. Or if you're feeling bold, you can unmute and we'll hear you in the room. Um, so we'll start with the Zoomers. Um, David Wilkins, love the connections being made to the Italian fight for independence. Penny Kobe, splendid talk, a very accomplished speaker. Would like to see more of him. There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed the, <laughs> there he is. Enjoyed the slides. And the hat. Thank you very much. More fan mail pouring in on the, on the chat. So anyone in the room got something they would like to contribute at this stage. There we go. One moment. Take the microphone across to Tom. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you. Was this was this propaganda for the unification of Italy? And why did it not, if it's so, why did it not come from Italy? It seems to have come from other countries. Yeah, good question. I suppose a lot of it was uh, politically inspired I don't know about propaganda, but certainly if you look at who bought them, who commissioned them, you could say some of it, it's part of a propaganda. It's part of a campaign of imagery, and there was probably text as well promoting these same ideas. The commissions in Italy, I would say, could be interpreted as, as almost propaganda. Uh, abroad, though, as I said, in most other countries, um, foreigners could not see these recreations of the Italian Renaissance as linked the contemporary Italian history. They saw it really as reminders of maybe their own history. Um, you know, the Italian Renaissance, I think, was a great um, spur for uh, British 19th century patrons who felt that maybe they could have a Renaissance of their own, that they could emulate the patronage of people like Lorenzo de Medici. So they focused on the cultural achievements rather than the political achievements. So, but in Italy, I would say absolutely. A lot of Italian patrons and artists were focused on political ends. Yeah, definitely. Good. Oh, Duncan at the back then. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. The, the set, you can make the same themes uh, with the history of opera and music in the, in the 19th century. And I just want, if you could tell us something about the role of the censor, because the sense the opera writers had to submit their librettos and operas to the censors. Yeah. Uh, in order to avoid them being too much to do with liberty. Did painters have to be censored in the same way? That's a great question. Um, no, I don't think there was a similar mechanism, but
but I should imagine that artists, uh, I don't know. So I'm imagining though that artists would, um, what they risked was rejection by the salons um, and re their reputation perhaps, but I don't think these had to be submitted in the same way as those uh, librettos. Although I could be wrong. That's a great question. Good question. Um, for the Zoomers, I note that Sarah has put the weekly reminder about your donations up on the chat. So have a look at that and don't forget to donate whatever you feel comfortable with if you wish to. Thank you very much. Um, more thoughts from the room or indeed from the Zoom. I think much in the chat. Oh, yes, here we are. Um, John, Jonathan Mandelbaum, who I think is in France, said, okay. yes, read out the French LHOQ is indeed an adult's only title. <laughs> Just a t detail, but Duchamp only claims credit for the goatee. He says the moustache is by P Picabia. So it was a joint effort. Okay. <laughs> there Elaborate you go. It. Being Elaborate put right it. by John. Thanks, John. Thank um, Christine Lloyd says, such a fascinating talk. Thank you. Who were the Nazarene movement artists you showed? Sorry if I missed something. Yeah. Um, I know one of them, uh, yeah, I showed two without titles. One was uh, Overbeck again. I can't remember the name of the other one that I showed. Sorry about that. Yo. Who's a Weagle? Who oh. has a Weagle in the Waggle? <laughs> So somebody's talking to us, but we can't quite hear you clearly. Oh, they've gone away again. All right, that's exciting. Um, Deus ex machina. Um, any more from the room? No, okay. No. Hello. Is, is there somebody on the Zoom who's trying to talk to us? If so, unmute and talk to us clearly, and we'll hear you. No. Bit of interference. No mind. I think that's probably a cue that we're coming towards the natural end of this fascinating talk. So, as always, I need to do a couple of thanks. Um, I just want to actually acknowledge uh, that we got several uh, of the students from the University of Cambridge with us this evening who are here with us for a week studying Italian. Benvenuti tutti a voi. Thanks for being here. Um, I also want to say a thank you to Knight Frank, who are um, our platinum sponsors for the current season through to the summer. So thanks, Knight Frank, for doing that. If you want to buy fancy real estate, they're the guys to go to. Um, uh, once again, thanks to Janet for um, sponsoring this evening. Thank you, Janet. Yay. Um, I, I think I've got maybe two unsponsored lectures in June. So if anybody wants to get the in on the, that act, please come and talk to me or Sarah afterwards. Um, in a moment, we're going to go through for the first uh, session with our new wine partner for the spring summer season, which is Rufino. Um, and we'll be drinking one of, I think, one of their good red wines tonight. I can't remember quite what but, um, they've got prepared, but that's through in the other room in just one moment. Um, but last but certainly not least, thanks so much to Kevin for a great talk. And uh, I, think you, I think you'll have to come back again in the autumn with all this fan mail. <laughs> Thank you very much.